title of the sermon this morning is Man's Fickle Nature. Man's Fickle Nature. Um, so we'll be reading the text. Uh, the way I've structured the sermon this morning is uh, I'm going to be giving uh, kind of an exposition of the text, kind of going through it uh, verse by verse, passage by passage, and then I'll have application at the end of the sermon. Uh, so stay tuned for the application part, um, but um, we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, let's open with a word of prayer and ask for God to uh, speak to us now uh, during this time as we examine his word. Lord, we come before you as a, as a body of believers, visitors, guests, uh, and asking, Lord, that you now would bless this time. Lord, we, we believe that your desire is to speak to us. And Lord, I only pray that our desire is to listen. So God, I pray now that you would help us in our weakness to, to listen to you. Lord, if we're battling tiredness, if we're battling discouragement, if we're battling sin, maybe if we're even battling obstinance, Lord, and, and sitting here this morning saying, I don't want to listen to this, I pray, Lord, that you would overcome our desire and give us a desire to want to listen, not to me, but to you, God. I pray that you would speak to us this morning, God, and that, more importantly, that we would listen to it um, and take it and receive it and put it in practice. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, whenever you give a list of things and you want to stress a particular item uh, in that list, uh, typically the, the item that you want to stress, you would put at the beginning of the list, or you might put it at the end of the list to stress it. Uh, when God gave his people the Ten Commandments, he did both. He put it at the beginning and the end. Uh, God wanted to stress to his people in the Ten Commandments that the foundation of his relationship with them was no idolatry. So God said to his people, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, for I, the Lord, am a jealous God. So God is stressing at the beginning of his law, the very first command that he gives of the 613 commands that he's going to give is this, no idolatry. And then at the end of those 10 commandments, the, the foundation of his law, he repeats it. He says, you shall not covet. Now that may not seem like idolatry, but we know from uh, Colossians 3, 5, Paul says that covetousness is idolatry. So God bookended his Ten Commandments with the same command. No idolatry is permitted. God is very clear here. And right after God gives these laws, he repeats them again, just six verses later. In Exodus 20, verse 23, he says, You shall not make gods of silver to be with me, nor shall you make for yourselves gods of gold. So three times in that short little passage, God repeats, because if you want to stress something, you repeat it, right? I remember when I uh, was working at UPS, before I uh, came here to this church, we had this thing called the eight keys to lifting and lowering. And they would make us say that over and over and over again. I could still give you all eight today, you know, get close to the object, bend at the knees, Test opposite corners, test it, you know, like there's all these steps and they, and they would just make you repeat it over and over and over again. Why? Because when you repeat something, it, it, it's, it's to stress it. It's to, to make sure it sinks in to the people that you're stressing it to. And this is what God is doing. He's uh, emphasizing no idolatry. He wants to, to make sure that they clearly understand that he is a God who will not share his worship with anything or anyone else. Not only this, Moses had clearly communicated this to all the people. We see this in chapter 19, verse 7. So Moses came and set before them all the words that the Lord had commanded him. We see it again in chapter 24, verse 3. In our text this morning, we'll get there. Uh, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and the rules. So there's not a breakdown in communication. Right? I mean, you might think, well, maybe there's a breakdown of communication. This, this is not like our movie telephone game. You know, we, we play this game on Friday nights where, you know, you have like four people and you describe a movie and 
it starts off being the little mermaid and by the time it makes it down to the end it's the terminator you know this is there's not a breakdown of communication god had clearly communicated his expectations to the people moses had clearly communicated those expectations he's repeated himself multiple times and the people understand what's expected of them we know they understand what's expected of them and, and they agree to obey because back in exodus 19 8 this is what they say all the people answered together and said all that the lord has spoken we will do and twice in our text this morning in chapter 24 they say the exact same thing they say we understand we will obey and yet we're going to see just 40 days later the people don't obey just 40 days later they begin to engage in idolatry why man's fickle nature you know if there's one thing that we learn about god in scripture it's this god is faithful and if there's one thing we learn about man in scripture it's this we are fickle the two are juxtaposed all throughout scripture it's like faithfulness fickleness faithfulness fickleness faithfulness fickleness it's just over and over and over again you see it all throughout the bible and we're going to see it here this morning in our text in chapter 24. So let's look at the text. If you will follow along with me in your Bible, uh, Exodus 24, let's begin in verse 1 to 2. Then he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. Now remember, Aaron is Moses' older brother. He's the head priest at this time. Nadab and Abihu are Aaron's sons. And since we're just, uh, go off on a rabbit trail for just real quick, since we're talking about the fickleness of man, I just want to point out, if you remember, Nadab and Abihu will later be killed by the Lord for offering unauthorized fire. They offered unauthorized fire to the Lord and God came and consumed them with fire. Now, why do I point this out? I point this out just to say that just because you're somebody special, you know, I imagine that Nadab and Abihu might have thought they were somebody special, right? I mean, look at it. God says Moses comes up, Aaron comes up, Nadab and Abihu come up, and 70 elders. I mean, only Nadab and Abihu and Moses and Aaron are named. Just because you're somebody special, just because you're part of the in crowd, don't get prideful or presumptuous or careless. They did, and later it cost them their life. Verse 3, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. So here is our first, uh, uh, I'm sorry, and all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words that the Lord has spoken we will do. So here's our first instance in our tech, text this morning where the people are making a commitment to Moses and in effect to the Lord, that they will obey him. They start off with the desire and a commitment to obey the Lord. Verse 4 to 6, And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning. He built an altar at the foot of the mountain and twelve pillars, according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of Israel, the people of Israel, who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in the basins, and half of the blood he threw against the altar. <clears throat> so we have here in verse 4 to 6 that Moses is writing down everything that God had told him. Now this is important for two reasons. Number one, for newer members of the community. This is important to have these rules written down so that these instructions can be passed along to newer members of the community. Two, so that if there's a fuzzy recollection of what had transpired, they can go back and look at the records. Kind of like wiping at our business meetings, you know? Like if you want to know who motioned this and who motioned that, right? She writes it down so that we can go back and be like, oh, Chris motioned that. No, 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 no. That was Gloria who motioned it. I have it right here, right? So the people can't claim, oh, I, I didn't know that I wasn't supposed to make this golden idol. I didn't know that. They can't claim that 
It's being written down. And I want you to notice in verse 5 and 6 that the people are obeying. They're offering burnt offerings. They're offering peace offerings to God. This is in accordance with what God had previously told them. In chapter 20, verse 24, God said, An altar of earth you shall make for me and sacrifice on it burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. So the people are doing what they're supposed to be doing. They start off on a good note. Isn't that how it normally happens? Verse 7. Moses, uh, then he took the book of the covenant and he read it in the hearing of people and they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And we will be obedient. So Moses takes this book of the covenant. Here we have the first use of Scripture being read before people. First time in the Bible we see Scripture being read to the people. In this book of the covenant, this is presumably Exodus 20, 21, 22, and 23. Those four chapters. Now we don't know exactly what Moses read here, but I'm going to assume that it's, he started in Exodus 20, verse 1. Right? He started with the Ten Commandments which was, you shall have no other gods before me. No carved images. None of it. I'm assuming he started there. And what was the people's response to this reading when Moses uh, stood there and read this to them? For the second time in this chapter, and the third time in the book of Exodus, they say, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. We will be obedient. And I want to point out, these are not just empty words. This is not just some half-hearted commitment. They are actually making a covenant with God Almighty right here and right now. This is the book of the covenant. So when they agree to obey the book of the covenant, they're making a covenant. They're making a vow to God himself. We know this because of verse 8. Look at verse 8. Moses took the blood and he threw it on the people. And said, Behold, the blood of the covenant the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Now that's kind of weird, right? Throwing blood on people. We're actually going to practice this this morning. I have some right here. Uh, No, I'm just kidding. Um, Blood was a symbol of the covenant. Much like wearing a wedding ring is a symbol. This is a symbol that I made a covenant with my wife. Blood was their symbol. Now, I guess the closest thing we have today is like face paint. You know, if you go to a Seahawks game, you paint blue and green. And that like tells people that like I'm loyal to this team. I made a commitment to support them and follow them. That's probably the closest thing we have to blood being a symbol of a covenant. So they have voluntarily entered into a covenant with the Lord. They have vowed to obey this book. Remember that in just a minute. Verse 9 to 11. These verses are really cool. They're all cool, but... Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw God. They actually see God. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God... And they ate and drank. There's several things I want to point out in these verses here. Number one, they got to see God. Now, it's not a full manifestation of God. John tells us in 1 John, no one has ever seen God. All right? So they don't see the fullness of God. Two, we further know that they don't see the fullness of God because all they can describe is the pavement. I mean, imagine if someone... Uh, took a trip to go see the greatest piece of architecture in the history of the world. It was this magnificent piece of architecture. And when they came back from their trip, you were like, what was it like? And, and the, the person said, well, the, the, the pavement was so clean. The sidewalk was so well kept. You're like, what? Like, is that all you can... God is so majestic so glorious, so beautiful, that all they can describe is the pavement. 
Three, he did not lay his hand. Now, why does the text say that he didn't lay his hand? Well, uh, ancient culture believed that if you saw God, you would immediately die. And yet God allowed them to come into his presence and to behold him. And four, not only does God allow them to come into his presence, he allows them to eat and drink in his presence. Now, if that doesn't blow you away, I want you to consider, imagine if you worked for Microsoft and the CEO of Microsoft called you into a meeting, the CEO, the head honcho, and you walked in eating a quarter pounder and drinking a Dr. Pepper. You'd never do that. Because this is somebody important. This is somebody to fear. And they're eating and drinking in the presence of God. Now I'm going to revisit this in just a minute, but just remember, keep in mind that Aaron is sitting in the presence of God, eating and drinking in the presence of God. Keep that in mind for just a minute. Verse 12 to 14, the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and wait there and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. So Moses rose with his assistant Joshua and Moses went up to the mountain of God and he said to the elders, wait here for us until we return to you. And behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute, let him go to them. So Moses goes up the mountain to receive the iconic stone tablets that God is going to write himself. When God writes, he uses stone for his paper. And what does he use for his pen? His finger. Exodus 31, 18. He gave to Moses the two tablets of stone written with the finger of God. I wonder what that's like to just be able to walk up to stone and just write, you know. That's got to be pretty cool. I want you to notice something that Moses says to the 70 elders in verse 14. In verse 14, he says, wait for us until we return to you. Moses is telling Aaron and elders, we're coming back. Stay here and wait for us. We're coming back to you. Now notice, they don't tell him how long. Typically when somebody says, you know, like, if I tell Lauren, uh, hey, stay here, uh, wait for me, I'll, I'll be back. Normally it's like five minutes, maybe an hour, you know? It's going to be a little bit longer than that. It's going to be a little bit longer than that. We'll get there. Chapter fi uh, Verse 15 to 17. Then Moses went up the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Even though Moses is far away from the people, they can see that God is talking with him. They can look up the mountain and they see the glory of the Lord. It looks like a devouring fire on top of the mountain. So it's not like the people have no clue as to what's going on. They, they see that God is meeting with Moses. And then verse 18, Moses entered the cloud and went up the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Now, we don't know if that's meant to be literal. 40 days and 40 nights was often just a symbolic number, kind of like the way we use the word dozens, right? That was how they used the word 40 days and 40 nights. So it could have been more than 40 days. It could have been less than 40 days, but for the sake of ease and clarity, let's just assume it was a literal 40 days and 40 nights, all right? So just shy of six weeks. Moses is up there just shy of six weeks. Now, that concludes chapter 24. Now, chapter 25 through chapter 31, those seven chapters is God's instructions to Moses during these 40 days and 40 nights, all right? All seven of those chapters take place in these 40 days and 40 nights. And I want to conclude with one extra verse uh, for our exposition this morning. I want to add one verse to this this morning. Chapter 32, verse 1. Now, before we read it, let me remind us of some things before we read that verse. We don't know the exact time difference between 24, 18, and 32 1. 
All right, but we're just going to assume that it's 40 days. We're going to assume it's just a little bit shy of six weeks. And before we read chapter 32, verse 1, let's keep these verses in mind. All right? Keep these in mind before we read 32, 1. Chapter 19, verse 8. The people say, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Chapter 20, verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. Chapter 20, verse 4. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. Chapter 24, verse 3. And the people answered with one voice and said, All that the words the Lord has spoken, we will do. Chapter 24, verse 7. And they said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. We will be obedient. Chapter 24, verse 8. They make a covenant with God. To, to, they vow to be obedient. Chapter 24, 9 and 11. Aaron is eating and drinking in the presence of God. Chapter 24, verse 17. They beheld, beheld the glory of the Lord. Keep all of that in mind. And just 40 days later, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up! Make us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses... We do not know what has happened to him. How did the people go in less than six weeks from all that the Lord has spoken? We will do. We will be obedient to up. Make us gods who will go before us. man's fickle nature. This would be like a man vowing to his bride on his wedding day that he will remain faithful to her all the days of his life and then 40 days later having an affair. It's the exact same thing. And that's who we are. The text says that when the people saw that Moses delayed, how do we define delay? Sure, it was six weeks, right? But is that a long time? Is that a short time? Who can be dogmatic about time when we're dealing with a God who is timeless? They actually demand Aaron to make them gods. The word for up there, I love that. It's up. The word for up there is in the imperative mood. They're demanding Aaron to do this. Now, what do they want these gods for? They want gods who will go before them. Well, who does that sound like? We looked at that last week. This is Yahweh's role. That sounds like Yahweh's role. Look, look at these verses that we looked at last week. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud and by night in a pillar of fire. The pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire did not depart from before the people. Then the angel of God who was going before the host of Israel moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. God said, behold, I will stand before you on the rock at Horeb. And last week we saw that phrase seven times in, the, in chapter 23 where God says he will go before the people. This was God's role. God had been faithful to go before them in a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire through his holy angel. And now they have traded him for the whore down the street. And just 40 Days they have exchanged the faithfulness of God for the whore down the street. They quickly forgot how much, how well, and how faithfully Yahweh had gone before them. They also quickly forgot about Moses and his faithfulness. Look at uh, chapter 32, uh, uh, 1b. That phrase, this Moses, that's intentional. They don't say, as for Moses, they say, 
The, this there is it's a condescending word in the Hebrew to attach it with a name. It's kind of like saying, as for this Moses, you can hear the condescension in their voice. This is the nature of man. Fickle. We are fickle creatures. I hope that all of us would be humble enough to admit that we wrestle with fickleness. You know, one day we're walking in the Spirit, and one day we're walking in the flesh. One month we're doing well, having our quiet time, reading our Bible, sharing the Gospel, and the next month we've all but forgotten about God. You know, the thing about fickleness is that it can be on a macro scale or a micro scale. Meaning fickleness may come when we're comparing day to day or week to week or month to month or year to year. It can also come in a matter of minutes. Comparing minute to minute. I've talked to guys who have confessed to me before that five minutes before they came to worship, they were looking at pornography. And then they came to worship, sung praises, repented, were even weeping in worship, and then went home, and five minutes later, we're looking at pornography again. I've talked to multiple guys who have confessed that to me, and you know what? I wasn't shocked when I heard it. You know why? Because when I was a younger man, I was guilty of it too. It's not just with sexual things either. It's across the board. Anger. You ever been walking in the spirit, doing great, having a, you know, like, you, you feel like you're, like, spiritually, you're just doing phenomenal, like I've never been doing this well before in my life spiritually, and all it takes is the wrong person at the wrong time to say the wrong thing, and you lash out in anger. They just push the wrong button at the wrong time. Fear. You ever heard a sermon or a worship song or gone on a mission trip or whatever and you're all fired up? You're like, yeah, I'm going to share the gospel with everybody that I meet. And then you go to work the next day and fear of man sets in. Fear of losing your job sets in. Fear of being ostracized sets in. There are 10,000 more examples I could give. This is man's fickle nature. This is our fickle nature. Now the question we're here for this morning, how do we fight that? How do we fight against that fickle nature? That's what we're here for, to, to figure that out. So I'm going to give us five means to fight this tendency. All right, And they all come from this story. Here they are. Number one, remember what we have told God. At least three times in the book of Exodus, the people said to God, we will obey. Chapter 19, verse 8, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Chapter 24, verse 3, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Chapter 24, verse 7, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. We will be obedient but they quickly forgot their vows to God. You know, sometimes couples uh, renew their uh, marriage vows, you know, if they've been married 10 years or 20 years. Uh, I'm not sure that I agree with that or, you know, would ever do that. But I understand why people do that. Because it, it might be a means to remind yourself and the other party to what you committed to. To go back to what you vowed on this day, saying, to remember, I vowed this to you. So let me give us a practical suggestion. When we pray to God, I think it's important that we not only ask God for things, but that we tell Him things. Things that we will do. We're going through the Psalms right now on Friday nights. Um, which are songs or prayers. And uh, over 145 times, the psalmist uses this language of I will or we will. 145 times. 
My point is, there is value in vowing to the Lord. Now, I understand we might be, why we might be afraid to do this, right? Because we know we're fickle. We, we know we're not going to keep it. We might be fearful to say, God, this year I will be more generous. God, this year I will be pure. God, this year I will give up this idol. We're fearful to say those things to God because we know we're fickle. But listen, if the psalmist can use this language, I assume the psalmist didn't perfectly keep everything. You got, when you read the psalms and you hear the psalmist say, I will always shout for joy, I assume he didn't always shout for joy. But you have to vow things to God. Listen, the fickleness does not negate the desire to obey. It simply highlights how amazing God is to put up with our fickleness. I want to encourage you, tell God things, commit to Him things, vow to God things. Go back and then preach your commitments to God. Tell yourself, Matt, you committed to the Lord to be pure. Matt, you committed to the Lord to love people better. Matt, you you committed to God to kill this idol in your life. Remember what you have told God, what you've committed to Him. Two, remember what God has told us. Look at verse 7 here. Then he took the book of the covenant and he read it in the hearing of the people. Now why does Moses do this? Why does he read the book of the covenant? He's already communicated all these laws to the people. He had already told them all these laws. So why does he read them again? Because faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing. Every time that the people grew fickle and grew away from the Lord, it's because they forgot what God had told them. And it was through the hearing that they remembered that they loved God and that why they served Him. This is why when the exiles returned from captivity, if you remember, they had gone into captivity because of their fickleness, because they had sinned and whored after idols. When they come back from captivity, they told Ezra, the scribe, bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. This is why Josiah, when they found the book of the law, and they brought it to him, and he read it, he tore his clothes. Why? Because he realized they had forgotten the words of the Lord. They hadn't been obeying them. Guys, this is why I'm so passionate about teaching and preaching and and personal Bible study. Because apart from those things, we will remain fickle. Faith comes by hearing. This is why I'm passionate about you staying awake during the sermon. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing the word of God. Apart from that, we will remain fickle. It's a given. I will remain fickle. I have to preach to myself. I have to seek out the word myself. Or I will be fickle. When the people came to Aaron and said, Up! Make us gods! You know what Aaron should have done? Perhaps maybe killed them on, other than killing them on the spot, which God does command them to kill them later, but maybe he should have done that. Do you know what Aaron should have done? He should have pulled out the book of the covenant and read from Exodus 20, 3 to 4. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. Guys, we, we already have a God. If they said, yeah, 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 but we want gods who go before us. You know what he should have done? He should have pulled out Exodus 23, 20. Behold, I send an angel before you to guard you along the way, to bring you to the place that I prepared. Guys, God's already gone before us. It's right here. He told us. We don't don't need gods. We have one. 
remember what God has told you. Three, remember the beauty of the Lord. Forty days prior to Exodus 32, 1, Aaron is enjoying the highest privilege that anybody could have ever enjoyed in the history of the world. He was actually invited into the presence of God. He was allowed to see God. He beheld God. He ate and drank in God's presence. Aaron beheld the beauty of the Lord, and yet 40 days later, he forgot it. He traded the beauty of the Lord for the beauty of gold. One of the ways that we combat fickleness is to remember the beauty of the Lord. When I was a bachelor, I uh, frequently ate Hot Pockets and microwave burritos. I was satisfied. I was like, these are good. They're easy. Then I got married. And I was like, wow, there's actually food out there. I... My wife would make home-cooked meals, and I would eat it, and and I realized that Hot Pockets are nasty, and microwave burritos are nasty. I still eat them, but you know, (laughs) but they're nasty. And what's my point? My point is nobody eats Hot Pockets when they can have home-cooked meals. The psalmist prays, one thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. I love that. Oh, if I could just taste and see the Lord more and more deeply, surely I would not continuously run after these hot pockets of God's. Remember the beauty of the Lord, how beautiful he is. Aaron had forgotten it. Four, remember that God is timeless. Chapter 32, 1, it says, when the people saw that Moses delayed. Now, this is a little less than six weeks, right? So I guess some of us might be think, wow, I'm surprised they made it that long. I think that. I'm like, man. Others might think, really? You couldn't wait 40 days, guys? Like, that's not that long. You're already disobeying? See, I guess the thing about time is that time is relative. That's the thing about time. It's relative, which is why we have to remember that God is timeless. The difference between God's timetable and our timetable is that we have one. God has never been in a rush a single day in his life. He moves at his pace. And sometimes that's faster than we want. Like, slow down, God. Sometimes it's slower than we want. And sometimes it's molasses slower than we want. The people gave Moses six weeks. They held out for six weeks. You know, in our fast-paced society today, you know, we're just like, come on. We might have given him six hours. After six hours, we don't know what happened to Moses. Let's just make a God. Because of their impatience, they sinned greatly, and they're going to be punished greatly because of their impatience. So here's my encouragement, challenge. If you want to, I don't know if you're encouraged by challenging. Be careful that you don't do something stupid or foolish or impulsive or in the flesh because you can't wait or you don't want to wait. If it seems like God is taking forever to give you a job, a spouse, an answer, a calling, a solution, don't take matters into your own hands. God will give it to you when he's ready to give it to you. He will. He will give it to you. You can take it to the bank. He will give it to you when he's ready to give it to you. And if he doesn't give it to you, you didn't need it. If he doesn't give it to you, he decided you didn't need it. Five, remember there is no substitute for faith. 
Last point. We're going to talk about this in the coming weeks, but just as a preview, I don't think that the gods that they made with this golden calf that they made, I don't think that they were a substitute for God. I don't. I think that, I don't think that they're breaking the first commandment here. I think they're breaking the second commandment. I think that they wanted something physical and tangible as a physical manifestation of Yahweh. I think they built this this golden calf and then they assigned Yahweh to the golden calf, which was against God's command. Now here's the question, why would they do that? Why would they build something so so that it, it could be Yahweh? Why would they do that? Because it takes away the faith element. It takes away the faith element. Let me, let me explain. Let me, this might do it for some of you. Some, some of you won't. All right. Let me explain. Um, imagine if uh, <clears throat> there were two girls and one girl says, I have met the most incredible guy for you. And, and I want to I introduce you to him. And you're like, let's go to Panera at 12 o'clock. And you go sit down. You go to Panera and you sit down at the table. And you're like, here he is. Say hi. And you're like, there's no one there. And you're like, oh, he's an invisible boyfriend. And you're like, okay. And you're like, well, talk to him. Come on, talk to him. It's like, oh, okay, hi. What, why, why did you give me an invisible? He, like, what, what? He'll never leave you. He will never hurt you, ever. He'll never break up with you. He'll never do anything damaging to you. Okay? He's always listening to you at all times. And look, I even have some letters that he wrote you. I have some letters here. And you're like, but, okay. And look, you even, um, if you want to give to him, there's a little bag that you can put stuff in and you can give to him. Like if you want to buy a gift for his birthday or something, you can, you can give it to him. After a while, do you know what the girl says? I hate this relationship. I want a real boyfriend. I want a real boyfriend that I can hear and, and hug and touch and see and interact with. I don't, I don't like this invisible boyfriend. You see, it's easier. It's easier. It takes away the faith element. Fickleness comes in the context of idolatry when, because we want gods that we can touch and feel and see and conquer because it's easier. It's a whole lot easier to go out and get a job, make money, buy a boat, and drive it on the water than it is to step out of a boat and believe that God will give you the faith to walk on the water. Remember, there is no substitute for faith. Just because you can't see God or feel Him or touch Him or audibly hear Him, He's there. I assure you, He's there. He has never left your side once. Remember, what you have told God, what He has told you, the beauty of the Lord, that God is timeless and there's no substitute for faith.